So let's talk about some of the major developments from down to earth. Now here we have the first few important issues that have been discussed. Now plastic waste, plastic waste is a very big problem, especially in the developed nations. So US and European Union have been uh, pro providing most of their used plastics to China for recycling. So there has been a global dependence on most of the issues. But over the years, we have realized with this global tensions coming up, uh, the things and the scenario would and indeed are changing. However, when it comes to India, for richer states like Goa, you have 60 grams per capita per day consumption. On the other hand, the average Indian consumes 8 grams of plastic per day per capita. Now, uh, this is a scenario where we are now focusing on depletion of single-use plastic or removal or banning of the single-use plastic and then reduction in the plastic. So, when we are talking about reduction in the plastic, at one end, we are promoting uh, the local industries, but but on the other end, those industries associated with plastic are badly affected. So the job losses are seen, closure of small scale industries with plastic recycling are seen. Now, next important, very interesting aspect is the study of Verkhonyansk. Uh, now, this is a place in Siberia, which interestingly has a very wide temperature range from minus 67 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius. But recently, for the first time in 150 years, it has recorded a temperature of 38 degree Celsius, which is the highest temperature that it has recorded so far. Now, uh, with this high temperature, what's happening, the ice cover is becoming thin and it is affecting the north-south polar jet streams. Now, these polar jet streams affect the or lead to changes in the western disturbances because of which we have seen early rainfall period even in the countries like India and this is one of the reasons that we had early arrival of locust that has been seen. Now locust is a very very important topic this year. Locust plague probably there could be one question for sure on locust. The next is uh, some other important news. So in Madhya Pradesh, there has been a campaign which is Kill Corona. And this campaign aims to screen the total population of the state. India is now uh, imposing 20% custom duties on all green energy equipments coming from China. So for processing of uh, solar cells, photovoltaic cells, you have rare earth materials coming from China and all those rare earth materials would have a 20% custom duties but definitely it would on the other hand impact the local persons or the local buyers in the country as well. India is also planning to install 100 gigawatts of uh, solar connected plants by 2022 so a very big plan indeed for solar establishments. We also have a continuous emission effluence monitoring system this talks about the 17 different categories of industries from where the emissions or the effluence is coming. Similarly, with the help of school students in West Bengal, there had been a Snehar Parash, uh, Parash app that has been built. Now, this Snehar Parash app, which has been built, is a unique app which basically uh, connects the rural beneficiaries of West Bengal and helps them provide rupees 1000 as an assistance. The next few important topics, as we said, are locusts. We have already talked about those. Uh, now, under the locust, uh, what we need to understand that the locust plague has been spreading for a lot of years. This time, interestingly, after uh, the 1926 locust plague that had occurred, locusts have spread to the regions till Nepal. You have the Kathmandu Valley, uh, the regions of uh, uh, Dhang and Payuthan, which have been affected, and even in the north till Remchap, you have the significant effect of the locust that has been seen. Uh, you have a plant quarantine and pesticide management center at Lalitpur which has been studying the impact on uh, the rice fields, the locusts, the fodder glass and so on. Amazon rainforest have witnessed a 13 year high 
फॉरेस्ट फायर्स इन द एमेजॉन रेन फॉरेस्ट ना एमेजॉन रेन फॉरेस्ट अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ टिपिंग पॉइंट इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक दैट वी हैव ऑलरेडी कवर्ड इन आर प्रीवियस लेक्चर्स ना जॉब लॉस अकॉर्डिंग टू इंटरनेशनल लेबर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन देर हैज बीन सिग्निफिकेंट रजिस्ट्री ऑफ द जॉब लॉस यू हैव नियरली फोर हंड्रेड मिलियन फुल टाइम जॉब्स दैट हैव बीन लॉस्ड ओनली इन द सेकेंड क्वार्टर बिकॉज ऑफ द लॉकडाउन एंड ऑफ दिस नियरली टू थर्टी सिक्स टू थर्टी 36 million are from the region of asia pacific so a huge number of job loss and a lot of people turning to a uh, poverty line would be seen anions a very very important question again anions are the future basis for uh, the quantum con- computing they are the latest addition to quasi particles and they are not elementary particles but these are considered as collective particles of many of the electrons that are present in the solid de- uh, solid devices and therefore anions are very very important bitter gourd is known for managing diabetes controlling the blood sugar similarly you have turmeric which is important and and turmeric is known for its wound healing properties even recognized in the regions of united states uh, then you have uh, uh, turmeric uh, the bitter gourd which beco- belongs to the cucurbite family uh, you have various trace animals and uh, trace elements in which it is extremely rich and also uh, the domestication center of bitter gourd has been seen in the regions of eastern asia possibly the east india and the parts of southern china uh, when it comes to locusts there is another one more important aspect that we need to mention the second swarm of locusts is about to strike the regions of gujarat and this swarm is coming from the areas of somalia so in most of the news channel you will see uh, locusts coming from pakistan but it's mainly from china uh, from africa uh, that you have most of the locusts that are coming so somalia in africa is the place where you have the origin for the second swarm of locusts and it's believed to strike gujarat somewhere around mid of july now the next is the education and the digital divide with more use of uh, online classes there has been a creamy layer divide those who can afford the internet those who can afford computers are able to get education on the other hand those in the sarva shiksha abhiyan we could probably say are left behind so those availing the mid day meal sarva shiksha abhiyan are slowly and gradually left away so there has been a digital divide that has been created now if you look on to an household comparison a very interesting comparison that has been given here now this household uh, comparison shows in the rural areas you have only 4.4% of computers and 14% internet however in urban areas you have 23% of computers that are present and 42% of the households have internet facility so there is a huge r- rural urban disparity that is seen and we also have seen a huge significant rise in the subscribers so over uh, a period of 5 years we have registered 150 million subscribers that means we are gaining nearly 30 million subscribers every year similarly we have a project which is known as bharat net which aims to provide optical fiber connectivity to the rural areas nearly 2.5 lakh gram panchayats and that would be another way to help or strengthen the internet availabilities in the rural area so along with that we have the national digital literacy mission we have the pm digital saksharta abhiyan now if we focus on regional disparity uh, the lowest disparity between the urban usage and the rural usage is seen in the states of kerala himachal pradesh has highest access to internet both in the rural area and the urban area so himachal pradesh doing the best then you have highest number of computers in the urban area in the state of uttarakhand and lowest number uh, highest number of computers if we talk about in the rural area so in the urban area you for uttarakhand and you for uh, urban areas and in the rural areas it's kerala and you have the high uh, the least difference that could be seen in the rural and the urban areas in terms of computers that are seen in the state of kerala again so that is how we understand the regional disparity coming on to gender disparity nearly 79% males and 63% women have uh, phone 
uh, or mobile access now if we talk about the mobile uh, gender gap report which has been released by gsma it says that 42 percent women and 31 percent of the men have mobile phone in india uh, no, do not have mobile phone in india the reason being the cost of the handset so because of the cost of the handset and no one is ready to bear that cost the mobile devices are not present with most of the individuals and again if we talk about uh, the data traffic it has increased nearly 44 times in the last four years specifically attributed to free internet being provided by many of the uh, sellers now the next is the biomedical waste issues over the few past months we have seen 500 times increase in the bio bio waste medical so if this is a bio waste medical from household let's say it's mask or any other thing you need to have at least 72 hours being exposed being left and then disposed then if it is uh, from a quarantine area or a containment area either bleach solution or sodium hypochlorite should be used to disinfect it and then this must be disposed in yellow bags now these yellow bags even from the medical facilities uh, these yellow bags must be either incinerated or they should be burnt or they should be buried at least three meters deep from the ground so minimum depth is three meters that they should bury it uh, the next is some of the cities are trying their own unique ways for example bhopal is using foot operated hand washing or wash basins that could be used in the public areas uh, where it would be contactless the next interesting thing is in navi mumbai you have a kovi card uh, dashboard and a kovi card mobile app now this kovi card is a unique app which talks about uh, from which areas the biomedical waste needs to be collected and from those areas the biomedical waste would be collected if we talk about the lockdown and the pollution definitely during the period of lockdown there had been significant reduction mainly in the particulate matter 2.5 in the major cities by 45 to 88 percent and in the ncr region from 66 to 79 percent but immediately as the lockdown ruled away you had further increase that was seen except in the region of kolkata which is still registered 10 percent decline due to cyclone amphan now uh, that reduction that was there during the lockdown period has been attributed to various reasons 10 percent was due to uh, the closure of industries 15 percent was there due to reduction in the transport systems and nearly 15 percent was there due to the dust that is generated from the road traffics so that was a kind of distribution which led to reduction of the particulate matter in the atmosphere now if we talk about delhi you have seven industrial centers which are located close to Delhi. Sonipat, Panipat, Bhivari, Ghaziabad, Gurugaon, uh, Faridabad and Alwar are some of the major areas. Now these major areas use or are dependent highly on coal as one of the major industries. Uh, uh, major basis for industries the reason being coal falls in 5% GST the second reason is that you have nearly uh, the open general licensing that is seen for coal uh, however uh, again if we talk about the taxation you have uh, natural gas which is taxed at 40 percent so there needs to be a kind of change in the policy and we could have a first run policy where those plants which meet the new industrial standards or the new electricity standards uh, would get priority to sell the electricity and with this we can check the amount of pollution also with the lockdown period you had the bs6 emission rules that came in India and there was emission of uh, solid fuels for cooking uh, that was also seen so those are some of the reasons why we are attributing to lower pollution and how pollution could be checked now if you look onto the transport there has been a significantly interesting pattern during the lockdown period the residential movement increased 29% however for grocery it reduced to 43% a person who was going out for grocery daily now goes in every three days or a week pattern the trips to parks workplace transit and recreations have significantly decreased so the burden on the 
transport has decreased but if we talk about india we have only 7% of the total fund going for the footpath 17% of the fund going for bus agencies or uh, kind of public transport maintenance and 50% for road and infrastructure now what kind of road and infrastructure actually we need we need only the road and infrastructure for cycling or walking so what mayor of london has done he has brought in a unique package and that package talks about strengthening the the walkways for cycling and uh, the footpaths for uh, for walking so that is the kind of investment or the infrastructure funds that are going in also the cities which are very very compact have done extremely well with covid especially the cities of uh, korea then you have cities of japan philippines so the idea is these compact cities they are putting in more pressure on walking and cycling saving the transportation cost reducing the travel time uh, giving a thrust to productivity better health care and allowing energy saving options that could be seen so that is how we have seen a significant change now if we look on to country wise analysis hong kong basically has talked about dropping 40 to 60% fears of uh, the incomes in the pandemic period uh, also the commuters would be given 20% fare subsidy during this pandemic period us has created additional 20 million fund for uh, transit services similarly kazakhstan has introduced tax and social payment exemption so there have been various efforts that have been done by different countries now the, here are some of the common drugs which have been experimented with covid but of these the first few ones have seen good results if we talk about the last few ones there have been they were initially considered successful but over the longer periods the results have not been successful so the most effective ones here is the remsvir uh, which is which was initially used for ebola and merck and then you also have the in Inflimax, uh, this is one of the medicines which is used for autoimmune disorders but mainly for cytokine storms in the case of COVID. So again a very very important question. So this list is probably important. You could have some of the names that could be asked. Now vaccine stage and trials are very very important. India however has named one of its vaccines but India is not even in the phase uh, 2 and 3 of the trials as of now. So firstly we have an exploratory stage which is a laboratory finding identifying the antigens and then the harmful pathogens and trying to react those the preclinical stage works on animal testing then you have the clinical stage trials which are in three stages phase one two and three phase one on a small group of five to fifty people who receive trials to assess the uh, safety and uh, to optimize the dose uh, schedule that is there Phase 2 is given to infected people around 1000 uh, who are actually suffering from the disease and phase 3 is a confirmatory stage of trial which is given to thousands of people and tested for uh, safety issues. So uh, fi uh, finally after the phase 3 you have the uh, review and the market launch that takes place. Now only two of the companies are in the phase 3 trials. Those are China's Sinovac which is working on inactivated platform and the next is from UK uh, by the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca. Uh, this is working on non-replicating viral vector. Uh, viral vector. Now these are two two of those which are in the phase three of the trial. Under phase two, you have Moderna uh, from Moderna from US, which is highly in news these days because of uh, some of the issues that were registered with uh, people on whom they were administered. And this is based on RNA. Uh, the next is the Cancino or the Beijing Institute of Biotech, which is on the phase two of the trials, and that is on the non-replicating viral vectors. Now. In India, ICMR has given a guidelines to release it in a period of 38 days, which is basically kind of unethical because usually a vaccine takes around 10 to 20 years to be released. And even if we are working on a fast track mechanism, it takes nearly 1.6 years at the minimum to have the best and the safest scores that could be given. So by mandating these kind of vaccine trials to be completed within 38 days and to be launched on 15th August is not a kind of ethical way of moving forward with a release of a vaccine that could be given to masses. Similarly, the Bharat Biotech, which has released uh, the name for the vaccine, the Corovin, uh, 
had similarly done it for Zika and the name of Zika back in back in 2016 and it was merely for the publicity there was no vaccine that finally came up if we talk about the zoonotic diseases preventing the next pandemic zoonotic diseases and how to break the chain of the transmission has been focused it is believed that 60% of the infectious disease in human beings are zoonotic and 75% of all the in emerging infectious disease are again zoonotic in nature covid has already killed half a million population which is a significant proportion but overall if we look onto the picture nearly 2 million die of the various zoonotic diseases across the globe and this has resulted in a loss of us 100 billion dollars in economic activity worldwide so this is the kind of loss that we are facing because of the pandemics as the warmer temperature increases these vector population further rises and uh, the erratic weather conditions also give a thrust to these uh, zoonotic diseases or in rise in the diseases for example in 2010 in africa you had the rift valley fever along the rift valley that came up and this was a mosquito borne bon zoonotic disease which occurred with higher than average uh, seasonal rainfall that was seen now if we look on to bats these are the only mammals capable of true flight echolocation goes in night have unique body shape uh, hangs themselves upside down and those are some of the basic characters but there are some interesting facts that we need to know a bat can eat nearly 5000 mosquitoes in one night even a small bat and therefore can significantly reduce the mosquito borne uh, disease incidence that could occur similarly 70% of the bats are predators on insects and crop pests so they are very good for the farmers they move a long distance of 20 km and then can pollinate so they are excellent seed disperse, dispersers they can give rise to forest regeneration and a kind of uh, diversity and seed dispersal that could be seen 29% of all the bats are dependent on plant for the food There are nearly thirteen hundred varieties of bats that exist in the globe, and therefore, if we think about that COVID being spread by bats and killing bats is the solution, this is actually not an optimum solution because these are the uh, mammals which are the highest groups after any rodents, and they have numerous species in the form of insect eating, in the form of fruit bats, which are also known as flying foxes in India, and even their droppings. or the guano is very very uh, useful because it facilitates nutrient transfer in the soil so what would be a good approach is to avoid eating the fruit that is being eaten by bats or to get in close contact with uh, bats in a closed space or the caves and to uh, see that minimum contamination occurs through the bat excreta however uh statistically if we look we have 5% of the bats that have gone end injured and for 11% of the bats you have data deficiency that is seen so some of the bats the fruit bats have been categorized under schedule 5 of the wildlife protection act and they have been categorized similar to the other vermin species like rats the next is a one health approach now one health approach is a unique approach to study the zoonotic pathogens to understand the adaptation the epidemiology and the trans Uh, or the transmission that occurs so if we look on to the various diseases be it salmonella be it escherichia coli these are the infections which lead to diarrheal deaths or diarrheal infection in nearly 3 to 5 billion population on an yearly basis similarly the potato blight had an infestation of fungus uh, which led to death of millions of irish citizens that was seen mass flowering of bamboo leads to rapid multiplication of the rodents living in that area and as a result once the seeds are exhausted uh, the bacteria which is the yersinia pestis enters uh, pestis enters into human body and can lead to plague so mass flowering of bamboos can lead to plague and the spread of plague similarly salmonella uh, from the rodents feces and you have uh, the roots of the rock 
crest plants that are seen are some of uh, the areas which are seen where uh, transmissions have been seen and these have been going to human beings so one health approach which is studying all these kind of zoonotic diseases their effect their adaptations their study has been very very important the next is the biomass gasifier now uh, the reason of chanpatia the reason of uh, sorry the region of chanpatia uh, in the West Champaran area of Bihar has registered a unique mix of biomass plus solar power, a solar power of 40 kilowatts and a biomass of 20 kilo, 25 kilowatts which works during the night time when the solar uh, power does not work has given the village a change and this strategy has been adopted by Husk Power. Similar modules are being uh, worked out in the regions of Tanzania as well. There are uh, a grid of 85 mini um, grids that are seen and those have been operational across the globe. So 16% of the 10,000 rural households and 40% of the 2,000 commercial establishments depend on decentralized sources of uh, diesel generation or uh, electricity generation that could be seen and those could be substituted by the efforts similar to those being done by husk power the next is the change in agricultural method a very very important topic so rice so far has been uh, done by transplanting seeds but now with labor moving out or reverse migration occurring what is happening you have the direct seeding technique that is gaining importance this has already started back in 1980s in china uh, 1990s in korea and around 2000s in bangladesh india is now starting this in the regions of punjab the reason being labor not available so what you have to do is you have to move with a direct seeding technique which requires less labor but it requires huge amount of uh, seeds that are there so where the transplanting variety requires 10 to 15 kg of seed per uh, hectare that is seen it requires nearly 100 kg of seeds dsr has higher number of weeds that are seen uh, the pest infest infestations are much higher uh, for T uh, tpr for transplantation you require more water so uh, a good way to substitute it with dsr is already the regions of punjab and haryana are struggling with water scarcity 85 percent of the districts already water is scarce so in that scenario uh, direct seeding rice is a very good uh, technique that could be used so less water table uh, less water would be required so that would resolve the issue of declining water table similarly the water consumption uh, would be reduced by 30 percent 35 percent labor cost going down by 60 percent and methane emissions which are significantly high from the transplanted region would decline by 6 to 92 percent so definitely a significant decline in the methane emission that is seen now the dsr could be of two types dry or wet now the dry dsr dry uh, direct seeding rice technique is where rice seeds are sown in the uh, dry uh, dry soil however under the wet they are sown in the wet soil a uh, modification of the wet soil is the tatarvatar uh, dsr which is the optimum moisture that is present now here you have the field which is laser leveled and pre sowing is done with the help of irrigation the field is prepared for optimum moisture conditions and weeds are uh, weedicides are sprayed uh, irrigation is done 21 days after the sowing is completed and the delay in the irrigation basically promotes better root growth and deeper root growth that could be seen and this also reduces the nutritional uh, deficiencies that are there however with dsr we have seen brown leaf spots that are seen with most of the rice crops uh, DSR DSR is a good technique which works well with medium to heavy textured soil and even the loamy sandy soil that is seen and it's believed that by 2025 we need to have nearly 20 million of the area under cultivation uh, in the regions of Asia which would be facing water scarcity so definitely moving from a transplanted variety to a DSR is a must so here are some of the statistics which talks about the transplanting cost and the DSR cost the yields 
the water requirement and the cost for the weed management so those were some of the major things three important very important topics probably a sure question for your examination are dsr versus the tpr the direct seeding variety uh, the direct seeding rice which is very very important bats how they are useful and the vaccine the stages under which the vaccine is released and which uh, country or which company is under which stage of manufacturing so those are some of the key highlights that we have discussed and as we said locust is another very important topic you need not to miss we would be covering many interesting topics stay tuned have a wonderful day ahead